Good morning. Welcome to the University of Arizona Garden and Country Extension webinar series. My name is Chris Jones. I'm your moderator, the Gila County Cooperative Extension Agent. And today I've got Carol Acarius with us. We're going to be talking about when the smoke clears, the road to recovery following large scale wildfire. And those of us in the Gila County area that experienced the telegraph and the mezcal and now the bat and the backbone fire, this is a very timely presentation for us. Uh, a little bit about the University of Arizona, uh, these webinars from the University of Arizona. They're a weekly Zoom webinar, 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11, featuring a variety of horticulture and natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County and any place else that's having the same types of issues. The recording will be posted at uh, extension.arizona.edu slash Gila, as well as the uh, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube playlist. That'll get up there first. I've been sharing that. So if you don't have the link to that playlist, let me know and I'll share that with you. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. And with that, I'm going to take advantage of that cue to share the poll for our affirmative action um, for affirmative action. And so please take a moment here to uh, indicate your age and gender and ethnic group. Um, I report this information and I'll leave that up for a minute here while I am uh, get back into the slides to introduce Carol. Here's our agenda for today. Um, thank you for the, those of you who were able to join us a little early for the login and a little lag time. My name is Chris Jones, I'm your moderator. Our topic today is when the smoke clears, the road to recovery following large scale wildfire with Carol Acarius. She has about a 30 minute presentation, goes a little longer, well, that's fine too. We've got, uh, open that up for a Q and A, a little discussion with Carol. Feel free to put your questions into the Q&A um, button or into the chat box, and I can share those with Carol. And we will seek to wrap up here at the top of the hour at noon in Arizona. Here is our presenter. Carol is the uh, CEO of Coalitions and Collaboratives, also called COCO. And you can go to her website here, afterthaflames.com, for a lot of the information I believe she's gonna be sharing with us today. So with that, welcome, Carol. Thanks for coming, joining us today. And uh, gonna hand it over to you and we can get started. Excellent, thank you so much, Christopher. And let me get my screen shared. Um, and I'm gonna do a transition part way through this today. So just so folks know, um, I'll be doing a presentation and then I'll I'll do the um, drop off and go onto a website and show you guys a tool. And can I close this poll? I just did. <laughs> um, and, and then we'll come back into the presentation. And I will try to keep it moving pretty quickly. Um, but it's a big topic. And for folks in your community right now, it's especially a big topic that you're dealing with in re real time. Um, so Oh, why can't I, why won't it go? Okay, so a little about me. Um, I really have been intimately involved in over a dozen large wildfires over the years and the long-term post-fire recovery. And when I say long-term, um, we are still dealing with a fire that happened in 1996 on the ecological recovery. And we only finished post-fire flood mitigation recovery on a fire that happened in 2002 last year. So this really is a long-term process. Um, over the years, I've been an advisor in about 30 additional fires where I've spent some time in that community and studying that fire and working with stakeholders. I work on a national level on policy around pre-fire mitigation and post-fire recovery. Um, we are the COCO is the sponsor of the After the Flames conference and webinar series. And we have a post-fire resource page on the After the Flames website. Um, and then COCO provides mentoring to place-based natural resource efforts. Um, we run a program, for example, around providing grants to communities 
to increase their capacity to do pre-fire treatment through our AIM grant program. Um, so that's just a little about me. I'm gonna play a couple of videos real quickly. Um, oops, oops, oops. I'm... Look, Rosie, Rosie. So yeah, I can hear it. It's either that or, nope. Nope, it's coming. Yeah, look, look, look. I've never seen this in my life. Look. Look how this is why you get cool. You know, it's like that. Because of all the sad. You just suffocate in my life. See, that's why you're playing watching this. Because that's what they put away. Yeah, it's just like that. 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 So that flood just happened in your neighborhood. Yeah, can, Carol, if I could add just a little bit about that flood. The video is from Casey Castello. She put it on Facebook page, and so we were just sharing it. And um, that is, yeah, in Globe, Arizona, on the Pinal Creek, how quick in less than 60 seconds that it just went from dry to almost bank full. So go ahead. And I've been I've been out in drainages where we're doing work after a fire, and that's it. You start to hear that water moving down, and then all of a sudden it's on top of you and it's filling that channel. And I think, you know, that was a, a pretty respectable event, but at the same time, that's not kind of the worst case. So, what we can see in these post-fire floods is really dramatic flooding. Um, This particular footage is from New Mexico. This is normally a channel that takes about 40 cubic feet per second at bank full. So that's its normal flow. And this flood was estimated to be 20,000 cubic feet per second. And in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna play the whole um, slide for that. But when I talk about a cubic foot per second, think of a basketball as like a cubic foot. So if you stood on the banks of that Cochiti Creek in a normal day during sort of its peak annual flow, you'd see 40 basketballs go by you every second. But in that flood, 20,000 basketballs were going by every second. So just contemplating the difference in what happens in these fire ecosystems. And I frequently had people say to me, oh, I've lived in this house my entire life and it's never flooded here. Uh, and these generally are older people, me, myself being one, um, but they'll say, you know, oh, I've been here for 60 years, it's never flooded they didn't live there for 60 years with a fire scar above them. So once you have that changed ecosystem of a fire scar, you significantly increase the odds of an event happening. Um, so one of the things that happens after these fires and we tell folks, you really have to start to think about doing things that you may have never thought you needed to, had to, or could do in the past. Um, the phases of a disaster, I'd like to share this one because you know the fire is happening over here and and people are excited and then the fire is contained and there's a bit of a honeymoon period and people are like oh thank god the firefighters got the fire out and then starts the flooding and so then you end up with this disillusionment period of like oh my god will this ever stop you know nobody's doing anything um, and you work through the grief period and you rebuild. So 
during this working through this period though, there's gonna be multiple trigger events. And think of the trigger events as multiple floods that we know will come on a fire scar like this. So, you know, what's your number one concern after the fire? Most of the resources leave. So you guys just lived through these fires. You saw, you know, boatloads of, you know, firefighters, trucks, equipment, people, specialists, experts coming to the community. And then the flames go out and there's another fire somewhere else and they take off but that flood risk stays with you for a long time. And then there's long-term ecological effects that your community will have to deal with. Um, so task one really is thinking about life safety and how do we protect people, um, homes, businesses, campgrounds, playgrounds, you know, these are all at risk from post-fire flooding. Um, and these pictures are from Manitou Springs, a little community in Colorado after the Waldo Canyon fire. Um, so one of the things we talk to communities about, if you have one way in, one way out roads and you're not gonna be able to get people in and out of an area, really thinking ahead of time before the flooding happens of where can you land helicopters to save people's lives. Um, roads will be washed out and if they're one way in and one way out and it's washed out, you're, you're stuck there. And that means you have to be able to think of how to get out. A lot of times in a really vulnerable communities at risk like that, we will work on a tabletop exercise with folks to help them start to think about what to do, how to be prepared. Um, if you're gone and you're, you have an elderly parent or a child that's at home during the day and you're at work, how are you gonna connect with them? How are you gonna make sure they're safe? And then one of the first things we start doing is looking at houses and sandbagging them where applicable um, you know, to help protect those houses. Some of these places, if you're right in that drainage zone though, you know, it is very hard to protect a structure with a sandbag from a really big flood. Um, we also look at roads pretty closely um, and try to think about road closures and, and where we're gonna lose roads. Culverts and bridges frequently fail. Picture on the left is a culvert. Picture on the right is Highway 24, a major US highway um, that runs through Colorado and that's flooding coming down. That particular flood killed a driver who tried to get out of his car and the floodwaters carried him away and he was killed. Um, if you can get out and get up the hill before the flooding really gets any energy, that's a good option. But once there's even a couple inches of this flood water on a steeper road like that, stay in your car. Your car might move, you might move with it, but the best place to be is seat belted in that car. Um, culverts, that's a picture of a culvert that seems to be pointing in the wrong direction over on the right. Again, culverts and bridges fail frequently. Um, a lot of the times where you had a, a 24 or 36 inch culvert before, you know, one of these round metal culverts, you suddenly need a 20 foot box culvert in that same location. Um, so one of the best options for like driveways and roads that have less use is to put in a low water crossing. So you get rid of the culverts, you put a dip in the road where the water can cross and you harden the dip with big rock or concrete. Um, that way the water will pass over and not take out the culvert and thereby take out the road itself. Um, and be prepared for supply. So a lot of times we're working with a subdivision or a community that has private roads and it's not county maintained. If you're in such a community, the community should get some you know, road closure supplies immediately and be ready to close the roads yourselves. Um, and if there's any local government folks on here, public works, county department and transportation folks, especially important for you to have these things, stage them in places of vulnerability and, and be ready to get the closures done really quickly. Um, you know, we work a lot with the National Weather Service and Colorado Department of Transportation nowadays because the lesson has been learned the hard way about getting warning thresholds for closing roads and getting them closed every time you hit that threshold. And you might close a road thus 10 or 20 times that it didn't need to be closed. 
but I guarantee there will be times it needed to be closed. And if you didn't close it ahead of time, that's when people die. That's when cars are damaged. Um, so it's better to, to do that proactively. Um, controlled breaches on small dams. This is always a really hard thing for, for ranchers who have small stock dams or for irrigators. I don't know if there's much irrigation in your particular part of Arizona, Chris, but you know, we'll have these dams and it's very sad and painful for them to breach a dam ahead of time. But if you're in a drainage that's gonna be flooding, that little dam is going to break and it's gonna be an even bigger addition of water to the downstream flood. So we try and work with people to do that. If the dam is really critical and they can't at a minimum get a dam engineer out to look at them. And this can be a city reservoir. It can be a fairly large body of water or it can be these little or dams, but to, to if possible breach ahead of time, if not make sure the maintenance is up to par, get the dam safety engineer involved. So the next thing we tell folks right away is, this is a community effort. You have to work together. You have to get the stakeholders involved. And who are the stakeholders in a given fire? Damn near everybody in the community, your federal agencies, your state agencies, um, congressional representatives, their staff can be important to help bring funding. Um, National Weather Service, we always have them at our table. Um, the utilities, the conservation districts, conservancy districts, um, the state trust land boards, folks like that, local watershed groups. So a lot of times there's local place-based nonprofit groups in an area that do work, they're really good. And then BOAD groups, the volunteers active in disasters, that includes a lot of the churches and folks like that. So having those folks at your table early and talking about who's got what capacity, what can they bring to the table? How can we work together is an important step. Getting the information you need on fires. So this is the burn severity map for the telegraph fire um, and, and trying to start to understand that information and what it means. Um, burned area emergency response is the process that the US Forest Service or sometimes the BLM, if they have more of the land in a given area than the Forest Service does, goes through to identify post-fire issues. There's some misunderstanding though a lot of times in communities. They think, oh good, the bear team is here and they're going to fix it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the fire can't be fixed quickly or easily. Nature has to do its job and that can take decades. Um, and the bear teams got a very specific mission of protecting the values at risk on federal land. And so they will do things to protect their own values at risk on their federal lands, like campgrounds and, and other assets, um, endangered species that are found on their land, for example. But they're not going to mitigate the flooding to the point that it's going to protect your downstream assets, your home, your business, your highway. Um, that's not their mission. That's not their job. Um, but bear teams often do work with all these other partners. And so when, you, again, you have those folks working together, a lot of times we find synergy and opportunity to mitigate flooding on national forest system lands, but we're doing a project to mitigate impacts down below in the community. Um, the NRCS or Natural Resources Conservation Service comes into these places and they do an emergency watershed program. So it's NRCS EWP program um, that starts with them doing damage survey analysis. So they look at where are the most vulnerable properties. Um, and as they do their process, they can then bring money. Two caveats for this program, it does need a local government sponsor like a county or a city to step up and be the sponsor for the program. And it requires at least a 25% non-federal match 
to bring that money to the table. So a lot of times we'll get the local government will put in some match, we'll raise grant money through other sources like foundations, um, landowners will be asked to and step up to part or all of the match. You can count in-kind resources as a match, so that's like volunteer time or materials that are harvested on site. So if you're doing a project that requires you know, filling sandbags and you're able to harvest sandbag filling material on that property, then that material can be an in-kind contribution. Saves money, counts toward the match. Um, finally, one of the tools we use really extensively, and I'm gonna give you a quick demonstration, is USGS Stream Stats. So if you Google USGS Stream Stats, and I'm gonna share a different screen. I'm going to go to Safari and I've kind of started to zoom into your community. This is on stream stats. When you first go here, you get a US map and you can start zooming in down, down, down to get into the area you want. So I'm going to zoom again, going to zoom again so we get kind of closer in. And then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to click or select the region of study is Arizona. Sometimes you get a couple of different regions that you can choose from. Okay, so I've now zoomed into this area and I'm gonna click identify a study area. And I need to zoom in a little more. And once you start to see these blue lines showing up on the map, that means you've zoomed in enough. So let's say I lived along this road area here, along Pineal Creek Road. Um, and I, I'm wondering how is this possibly gonna affect me? What's gonna happen? I could drop a point. So I'm gonna come over and click the delineate button. And then I'm gonna come back onto the map. Where's my cursor? drop a point, and now you see the little spinny wheel of death down there in the corner. It's delineating a basin. It's starting to analyze the area that contributes to that point on the map. And it'll take just a minute. It's not ever the quickest tool, but it's really valuable. And you can look at very specific sites using it. So it just delineated that is the drainage area that drains to the specific point I just selected. Once I get there, I have these choices over here and I'm gonna click continue because I don't wanna clear the basin or download it. I'm gonna click continue. And then I am gonna select flood scenario data. So I'm gonna collect peak flow and flood volume statistics. There's actually a bunch of other basin characteristics you could collect like elevation, miles of stream channel, things like that. I'm not gonna show all those today, but you can go play with the tool. Um, then I'm gonna click continue and it's gonna calculate flood flows for this basin and tell me information about what pre-fire flooding would have looked at in this basin and it's still getting the information. Where's my report? There's my report. When you do this exercise, comes through, it builds this report about your basin that you selected. How many square miles, elevation, mean annual precipitation. Then you get down into this bottom part and it starts to tell you about the flooding. So peak flow um, for a one year, two day storm in that drainage would be 99 cubic feet per second pre-fire. Again, think 99 basketballs flowing by that point per second, okay? A 10 year storm event, would have been 643 cubic feet per second coming by there. Now take those numbers and multiply them by 10 
and by 60. And flooding is going to be somewhere between 10 times and 60 times the number you have there. So a two-year storm event could produce 6,000 cubic feet per second in the worst case. Take 99 basketballs and think you could potentially have 6,000 basketballs passing by in the same second. And that gives you an idea of how we see these changes in hydrology. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing this. And again, this is a free tool. It is available online. It's a little cumbersome the very first time you use it, but once you go through it a couple of times um, and you play around with it a little bit, it is not terribly hard to use. Um, and now where's my, my keynote at? Um, oh, I hope I didn't close it. That would have been a bad thing. Nope, there it is. All right, so can you now see my screen again, Chris? Okay. So take the data you develop, take your understanding of those areas that you have risks at, whether it's your personal risk at your home or your community risk, if you're the highway department guy, which roads are at most vulnerable, where do you need to worry about and start developing a recovery plan. Um, and again, you need everybody kind of at the table to develop this plan, but it should look at things like utilities, transportation, infrastructure, um, expanded social, medical, and mental health services. And I will tell you, after fires, we see a lot of PTSD in the community. A lot of people are stressed. They've just been through a trauma. Um, and so mental health actually becomes an issue. A person who normally is cool, calm, and collected, you know, if their house is getting hit by floodwaters, they're not so cool, calm, and collected anymore. So for a community, thinking about that um, is really critical. Economic recovery, building demolition, and then reconstruction for buildings that were damaged in the fire. Um, temporary housing, a lot of times if you lose homes, figuring out how do you keep the community intact debris removal, so cleaning up the debris from the fire, but also then being able to clean up the debris from the floods as they're happening. Um, planning and thinking about what flood mitigation activities you can do, and longer term sort of ecological restoration and, and building back more resiliently in the future. I wanna share some of the lessons that have been learned in different communities over the years. Um, start now gather your stakeholders immediately. If the community doesn't have a recovery committee, it needs to form one ASAP. Um, people need to be talking. Extension service needs to be at the table. Um, you know, the police, the fire chief, you know, everybody needs to be there and working on this. And that should be happening right now. Um, think through your personal hazards as well as those community hazards. Um, and it really inform and involve the whole community. And a lot of times that's hard. How do you get the word out? How do you talk to people? A lot of times it's actually like going into the community and going door to door in, to talk to residents where we know their houses are at risk from flooding. Um, then have a plan for utilizing volunteers and giving them meaningful work. After a fire, people wanna come, they wanna help. Um, we've had volunteers from the local community over the years, and we've had volunteers come from other states and, and bring 100 people to spend a week and help us on projects. Educate yourselves about the various programs from state and government agencies, um, federal agencies. You know, FEMA has its program. NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, has its program. The Forest Service has its program. So kind of understanding those programs and how they work together, what, what they have that's available for individual support, what they have that's available for community support, um, and how you can coordinate between the parties to maximize being able to take advantage of the tools that federal and state government can bring to you. Um, mitigate the risks as quickly as possible. So for example, 
sandbagging of homes should be happening today. <laughs> I mean, the day the fire is contained, downstream homes that are in drainage ways should start getting sandbagging done. Um, as you do projects, account, evaluate, and document your effects, and then repeat. Um, first off, you're going to probably be using federal and state government money, and there's a lot of documentation required for using that money. Um, but also, that helps with lessons learned for you and other communities on future fires. Um, a lot of times people come in like a community will get seven different authors from seven different agencies for doing various assessments and can spend a lot of money on the assessments. Pick one or two good assessments and focus on those. Don't try and assess everything and spend millions of dollars assessing and not actually doing work. And then it really ask for help from agencies and entities and nonprofits and then understand what they can bring to the table to you and to your community. So what we do first as an organization, um, we encourage property owners in a fire area and below in the areas that will be impacted by flooding to get flood insurance and to get weather radios. And I oftentimes, again, have people say, oh, I've lived here my whole life. It's never flooded. I don't need flood insurance. I'm not in the, the hundred year floodplain. Ignore what's in the map. <laughs> Look at the post-fire inundation maps. I know USGS has done one for here. You know, look at those maps, see where you are relative to inundation zones and get flood insurance. It's relatively cheap if you're not historically in a high prone flood area. Um, and if you don't get it, regular homeowners insurance does not cover floods period, end of story, you can lose everything. The other thing I'll say is a lot of times somebody will call their insurance agent and ask for flood insurance. And the insurance agents will say, oh no, because all the mud and all, that's a landslide and it's different insurance. It's not, I know this for a fact. <laughs> if, if you hear that from a flood, from an insurance agent say, I don't care, I want flood insurance. And you can go to FEMA's website and they actually have a discussion on how flood insurance covers post-fire flooding and debris flow and mud. So don't, don't let your insurance agent mislead you. Generally not intentional, but they just don't work in this arena enough. And the National Weather Service has weather radios that they're about $30. Um, a lot of times county emergency managers will buy them and give them to the most flood them vulnerable people in the community. But everybody anywhere near this area should have flood radios and listen to the weather warnings. Um, it will even wake you up. They're loud enough that if you're asleep and it's in your bedroom and the flood is happening at night after hours, those weather radios will wake you up. There was a flood in the Thompson fire in California a few years ago. The fire killed no one, the Thompson fire. The flood killed 200 people. And in part, it came late at night and people didn't know to get out of their homes or to go to higher ground or anything. And they just died in the flood. Um, one of the next first things we do is we really look at these culverts and crossings those are areas that will fail quickly in flooding. And so then we try and say, how do we storm proof, quote unquote, because you can't completely storm proof infrastructure, but how do we mitigate and do what we can to reduce the likelihood of a failure of that infrastructure? Um, remove hazard trees if your house survived, but you have to drive up a road that's got a bunch of burned trees right along the road. Um, getting those cut down early or burn trees that are around the house, but the house was saved. Get those cut early because they come down quickly and easily in a wind event. Um, and so a lot of times people are injured or killed by the hazard trees falling. Um, protecting structures and wells, again, you know, a lot of times that's sandbagging or we can sometimes use something called gabion baskets. Um, they're like a metal mesh metal basket that can be filled with rock. Um, sandbags, there's the small sandbags that individuals fill. And then you can buy big sandbags that can be filled by a piece of heavy equipment that are like four feet tall by four feet wide by four feet high. No, four, 
four, four by four by four. Um, so those get filled by a front end loader. Um, you can pretty quickly build a sandbag wall around a structure using them. One mistake people make with sandbags, don't put them right against the house. Even if you're sandbagging regular sandbags, put them out, you know, a, a few feet from the house because otherwise it just traps the water up against the house um, and actually causes more damage and can cause mold and other issues to the uh, break down foundations and things like that. So your sandbags should go out a little ways from the building. Um, again, we talk about not just protecting the structure, but wells. If you have a drinking water well, um, that should be sandbagged as well, because if your well gets contaminated with floodwaters, there's oftentimes that the well can no longer be used at all. Um, breaching small ponds where possible, if it's a bigger pond or a bigger dam, um, getting it inspected. Then we start, at that point in time, we've been through this first list of items. Now we start performing hill slope stabilization that can include seeding, mulching, putting in log erosion barriers, which is basically burn trees cut and laid into the hill slope, um, putting in wattles, so straw wattles above structures to reduce the hill slope destabilization that's going to happen. Um, and then as we're working on that, we get planning and we perform larger flood mitigation projects, such as this picture in the lower right is showing a sediment catchment up in a ephemeral drainage. So we dig out a hole. Um, the logs behind this are helping to stabilize the channel. When it floods, it comes down and it keeps filling this hole in that collects sediment and reduces flooding. Um, and finally, you know, plan, prepare, and exercise for these disasters. In these communities where you look and you go, we know this community is going to be impacted by flooding. You know, having a community meeting to talk about ingress, egress, talking again about what do you have in your go bag, um, being prepared. If you live in a house that's up a one-way road and you have livestock or really big horses, do you have enough extra feed put in that you don't have to get in and out to get feed? Um, do you have, if, you, if you've got somebody that has to get out for dialysis every couple of days, how are you going to get them out if the road is closed? Um, so planning, preparing, thinking about those things right now is one of the most important things you can do. Um, and then many people are going to want to help you. So having trained leaders and, and having a plan for utilizing those folks is important. Um, and developing and maintaining good relations between all these different stakeholders. That's why we talk about recovery meetings. People need to know what the other guy is doing. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than you're working on planning a project and then you find out somebody else has been working on planning essentially the same project because you guys weren't talking. So having those meetings, having people report out what are their issues, what are they working on? Um, and finally, don't put off those harder discussions with in that group. Um, you know, a lot of times we go to meetings and it's all a very nice we, we don't say the hard things, but after a fire, you got to talk about the hard stuff. So be willing to do that. Doesn't mean be disrespectful. Doesn't mean um, fights for the sake of picking a fight, but honesty and talking about things openly will go a long way. And that's all I have for the slides. So I'm going to stop the share um, and then we can go to questions, Chris, and or open discussion. This is a relatively small group today, so I don't care if you want to have folks able to speak or right. if you just want to keep it to the chat. No, no, Carol, thank you so much for your time today, sharing all that information. Um, people definitely take advantage of the recordings of these, and I had a few people say, I can't watch it right now, but they want the recording. So. Um, I like this for a small group, I guess, raise your hand, I can always just un unmute and allow you to um, talk with Carol direct di directly here. And so while people are putting in some chat messages or oh, I see some things in the Q&A right here. So one question in the Q&A is, is a flood radio, you were talking about a special radio, 
Are there radio stations with emergency info? How do we find them? Yeah, so the, the, the weather radios are special radios. Like I said, if you go on Amazon or you go into Target um, or Walmart, they usually do have weather radios. And so they're in the 25 to $30 range. And so it is, it exclusively broadcasts NOAA information for the area in question. Um, some community radio stations listen to weather radios and will report. So if during the day you have normally listen to a radio station, you might get that from your local radio station. But if you have that weather radio, if there is a flood warning being issued, that comes over that radio. They That's... plug in, um, they're cheap. Um, I know people who've had, you know, they'll buy a couple of them and stick one in the bedroom and one in the living room or something. So. Okay. And I guess it's worth looking to that to see if they've come up with an app or some newer ways that they're able to get that information out. But it, I, I yeah, recall it was, it was its own specific uh, radio wave, I believe. And I've seen yes. that on, on phone, you know, some radios will have different types of frequencies. So. Yeah, and a lot of times, so, and I don't know in your county, but a lot of times county emergency managers have a phone app that is like, you know, here in my county, it's called Code Red, and you can sign up for that phone app, and then that phone app, they push that out as a text message over the phone when there's a warning. So it's also right. worth looking at at those kind of things where your county might have it. Right, in Gila County, they call it Everbridge. Yeah, That's so sign great. up for Everbridge right. um, and get those messages. But of course, a lot of times in, in rural places in the West, you may be in a valley or something where you don't get good phone signal. The weather radios will actually penetrate even some of the steepest valleys, hmm. um, whereas your cell, you might not get a cell signal in some places, but the weather radios do usually penetrate into hard to access locations. Okay. Um, three um, feet from the house is actually, that's fine. So, you know, okay. I would I would say on the, the bagging, you know, we'll, we'll do three feet. Um, sometimes we'll do six feet. We can push that further out if we have the space and looking at where the drainage is, um, but somewhere in that range. Right, and I don't think our uh, attendees can see the questions, so. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. We were just asking <laughs> how far out from the house should the sandbags be, and Carol's confirming about three feet is good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, um, the next question, what factor of increase can we expect from pre-fire to post-fire in flood flow estimates? So again, we use a range of 10 times to 60 times, and that's a big range, but the big range it's because it depends on so many different factors. So let's say you've had three days of rain events. Ground's already pretty saturated. Creeks are already up, but it's been pretty mild rain. So hasn't flooded. And then you get a two inch in an hour high intensity rainstorm on that flood scar that's gonna to start to increase what we call the bulking factor. So we see 10 to 15 time increase just in hydrology. So just in the amount of water that comes off of a rain scar is 10 to 15 times what it was pre-fire. But then we get this bulking. So the more high intensity that the rainstorm is, the more sediment, debris, and by debris, I mean trees, rocks, you know, propane tanks, cars, horse trailers, houses, buildings, all can float. Um, giant concrete blocks. I, I just was on a fire scar with some folks last week or two weeks ago. And looking at down by the channel, there were some old Jersey barricades. So the concrete barricades that go between highway sections. Um, so if you got a four lane highway, a lot of times they have those concrete barricades in the middle of the lanes. Um, and I said to him, you need to get those moved up and out of the drainage way because they'll float. And he was like, they can't float. 
those things weigh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, and it's like, well, guess what? They float. <laughs> Um, concrete coffin blocks. So they're like a four by four by six foot block of concrete. People will often get those and use them for post-fire flood protection. And I look at them every time and go, oh no, they float. <laughs> um, so that's debris. Anyway, back to the question of the increase, the more high intensity the storm is, so the more rain in shorter duration, the more bulking you get the more sediment, the more erosion that comes with it and the more debris. And so that takes that, that water volume and increases it. And so maybe you had water volume at this height, but because of a high intensity storm, suddenly you're at this height, which is why we have this really wide range of factors that we use. Um, and I can't, there's no way to model all of those different possibilities. Um, just here at my house the other day, you know, and I'm in Colorado and it, we're normally pretty dry. We had one inch in 10 minutes. I didn't have a fire scar above me. It was not a big deal. Um, but had I had a fire scar above me, it suddenly would have been a major flood and with a lot of debris and erosion. And that's, that's what we're experiencing. And I believe when you were going through that slide, you could say, just go ahead and go 10 times to 60 times. Yeah. Of a factor of increase so yeah so whatever you amazing. get on those yeah. yeah whatever you get when you run that if you look at stream stats and you do it at your house you know and you say well let's see if we had this sort of 10-year return interval storm and they actually happen pretty frequently after fires because the fire scar sort of makes its own weather so if we have that 10-year storm in the first two or three years after the fire you know, we could see 60 times that flow. Okay, good. And and so our, our other person's asking about that with the weather radio again. It covers stuff the local radio stations don't. That is correct. Yes. Right? Yes. So, yes. And <clears throat> and again, it's not, you know, you're not going to be listening to country music on it. <laughs> you know, it's just going to make noise when it's issuing a weather warning so it'll do like that eh, eh, this is a, this is an emergency type of thing yeah and, it does something like that yeah. and then so, it'll say the national weather service has issued a flood mm -hmm. warning for the area of blah 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 and it's just dedicated to just those warnings yeah. it is just dedicated to the warnings okay all right so the good good confirmation something that we can do get make sure we have one of those those radios and um, I'm going to respond back to Judith here that the uh, recording of this webinar is going to be available at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube playlist. And I'll go ahead and drop that into the, um, the chat box right now so you can grab it and have it. And as folks, you know, I mean, if you are are playing with stream stats, and again, like I said, you can zoom in and and you can put a pin on your on the water closest to your house and run that that tool. So if you were further downstream in Globe, we would have gotten a bigger number than we got where I put it. Um, and if you go even further downstream, you know, a bigger number still. So you can kind of put those numbers into place. Now, again, part of why I say this can be a fairly dramatic range is it also depends on how much area gets hit. So if you go to the furthest point below a fire scar and say, okay, what would happen there? At that point, uh, a one day rain event could be different impact down there compared to an upper part of the basin, depending on how many of the sub watersheds. So when I talk about a watershed, I'm talking about all the area that drains to a given point. And in any fire, there's many sub watersheds. Some of them could be, you know, a 10 acre little face drainage, like in the picture behind Chris's head, you know, you see a little drainage area just above his head, and then a bigger mountain up above him up above that drainage area. So, you know, those are different sub watersheds and how, 
how a rain event affects each watershed will change how the flooding occurs. That's the other reason that we give a pretty big range because you can have a fairly high intensity storm that only hits maybe a couple acres of a fire and around the rest of the fire, it's not so high intensity or you can have a very high intensity storm over a large portion of the fire. And so that affects how big a change we see in flooding. But I have seen floods where it's 60 times the pre-fire condition. Very good, yeah, yeah. So another, just, just some more follow-up on this radio. Somebody I think likes this radio is asking, <laughs> does, does it report new fires too? And I don't believe it has anything to do with fires, right? Just no, nope. it's just weather. But the if there's a fire in the area, weather service will be reporting out fire weather information, and that will go out over the radio. Um, it's not going to report a new start of a fire for you, so that's not what the weather service does. Um, but if there's fire weather they are reporting fire weather in the area. Um, and fire weather is where there's a really high wind probability, low humidity kind of thing. That's when, what we call fire weather. Yeah, and um, I would think for fires, probably the Twitter feed from your state forestry department or state fire, fire, fire you know, state fire, that would probably be the first places you start seeing it. Yeah. Um, if you wait for InsaWeb, it's already a day or two old by the time they yes. get InsaWeb yes. report out. So InsaWeb is a um, website that the National Interagency Wildfire Council um, runs. So NIFSI runs InsaWeb. And that is that tracks all the large scale fires around the country. Um, and you can just Google InsaWeb, I N C I W E B. Um, and find InsaWeb, but just like Chris said, it only reports big fires. So by the time it's a big fire, you probably already know about it, but it does give update information every day on big fires. You can track what's going on with the big fires. And then you can also look at the bear or burned area emergency response reports on the InsaWeb page for that fire. Go Where ahead. can we find info on how bad the flood will be in East Verde estates? Um, and again, I mean, I would I would start looking at stream stats. I know Chris also has USGS had done a inundation study, Chris. So yeah, you I'll, may be able to share that link. I'll um, comment on that. I, I noticed that the county is uh, contracting with some company named J.E. Fuller out of uh, Flagstaff for engineers and hydrologists for the uh, inundation maps they're doing on Pinal Mountain. So I do not know the status of what they're doing on the backbone at this time, but I can get a message to Steve Sander and ask him at what stage he's at on that. And um, he's been sharing those maps with me. So if I get those, Michelle, I'll share them with you. That's that's what we know on that. But yeah. but yeah. but Michelle, you can go into stream stats and you can do your own quickie analysis. And again, it takes a few minutes. I walked through it pretty quickly, but you keep zooming in until you find, you know, where you want to be. There's actually a way to plug in an address and it, it should zoom more quickly to your address. No. And and Carol, then We've got Start. a small group here. Do you want to do that? Do you want to pull it up here? Does, do you think we can do that in real time sure. right now? Sure. We've got a couple of um, minutes for it. Yeah, we got a few minutes. So let me do share my screen. And, and while you're getting that up, Judith shared the um, AZ Fire Info website. And so that's a good place where new fire starts will get reported. Okay. So, so. this is the East Valley, East Verde estates it's up on the other half of the county so you're going to be going far away from globe okay it's up north the southeast north, or it's west. the north side of, of gila county okay. so zoom out a lot even more <laughs> oh no we're talking uh, over 100 miles away 
Okay, is there another fire? Yes, it's another fire, oh. the backbone fire. Ah, uh, okay. Isn't that down this way? No, no, other direction. Other direction. Other direction. So you're okay. going up to Payson. Payson, Arizona. Okay. Ah, there's Payson. Okay. okay. And up above Payson's an area called East Valley. Uh, well, um, I don't know. But Camp maybe Verde. I, <laughs> Pine. Um, so the the wildfire was at Fossil Springs area. Um, I don't know if we can. Let me see here. This is the problem with I'm um, okay. <laughs> scroll. I'm scroll. not an Arizonan. So. Yeah, come come back. You can get closer now. You can. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, zoom in. Okay, and just go up Highway 87, north on the highway there. Let's see if okay. we can find it, Michelle. Michelle, you want me to get you on, on here? You can <laughs> guide us in. Sure. Um, if you go to Payson, because you're at Pine right now, you're too okay. far. Back down. Uh, and okay, so you see Payson, uh, East Verde Estates is going to be so the East Verde River is what's running this river that's running, yeah, right north of Payson. Uh, and you're seeing, let's see here, is East Verde up there? I'm trying to figure this out. I see Bert North Toya Verde Road over here. And what you're, yeah, that is the Houston Mesa Road. So that community you're seeing to the right there off the Houston Mesa Road is called Mesa. Dell, we are to the left of that. So and about we'll where my cursor is? No, we're off Highway 87 to the left of that, if you can go up. And we're below oh. what the Highline fire burn scar was. And I okay. don't know if you remember in the news about two or three years ago after the Highline fire burned, 10 people drowned, a family drowned north. Oh, of I remember that. They yes, were they were far down. north of me um, on Clear Creek, which feeds into the East Verde River. Um, so by the time those people, so they were where the confluence of the East Verde and the Clear Creek is north of me. And then we are down here. You're going to, yeah, you're going a little too far. If you go to, uh, how to right there, this is East Verde Estates. There you go. This, this right in here. There That's East go. Verde Estates. Yeah. Uh, okay. The river runs through us. And far north of us at the base of the rim um, was where those 10 people died, but it's on the East Verde River. By the time those floodwaters arrived to my community, uh, they, they were not at all at the, the power they were to drown 10 people up north of me. So what I'm wondering is, you know, uh, would a fire have to be more where Mesa Dell is in order to affect my community with, I understand what you're saying, the flood of like debris and everything and mud that comes. Um, and so how do we determine, because there's a lot of different uh, microclimates between, you know, the rim there, and where I'm at. There are. Um, and, and so flood waters, once you get into sort of a, a larger river, mm -hmm. um, flood waters can move pretty far downstream. Um, and I'll give you an example of the Arkansas River in Colorado two years ago from one of the fires we worked on. And the Arkansas is a, a good size year round perennial river. This isn't a stream, this is a river. Um, and there's a gauge, a stream measuring gauge about 20 miles downstream of where the flood happened. And the gauge had been tootling along at about 2,800 cubic feet per second of flow over a few days. And the flood happened in our watershed 20 plus miles upstream. And when it hit the gauge, it went straight up 6,000 CFS. And that already had 20 miles of attenuation in the river or places that the water spread out, slowed down from the actual flood site. Mm -hmm. The flood in the sub drainage that we had the fire in was about 10,000 CFS. And that was in a creek that was normally about 50 cubic feet per second bankful flow in that 
that little creek. So 50 feet went to 10,000 cubic feet per second, 20 miles downstream when it, it added about 6,000 cubic feet per second in the big river that far downstream. Does that make okay. sense? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, but if you, if and, and I don't know, so it doesn't sound like right now there's been a fire above your exact neighborhood? No, what the concern is now with the backbone fire, it's, it's up, it's not even, uh, there's no towns or anything downstream from it. Um, all that the backbone fire threatens is a national wild and scenic river, the okay. Fossil Creek. Um, and I actually was blessed to be, I'm a reporter for a local newspaper, and I actually was able to see the damage from the backbone fire and just the whole edge of the canyons has been burned up, you know, from rim to rim. Uh, all that's left is a tiny little ribbon of riparian area at the bottom of this. Um, I believe, you know, they've already started a bear report going on this burn. Uh, it's, it's as a blessing, no one's going to be affected because it's, it's the Verde River is what this pours into way downstream. Um, but, you know, we don't know how long this is going to damage this. Uh, it's a travertine stream. It's like have a right. super um, I, We don't know what the consequences to that are going to be. Um, and I know that it, it's not, you know, cities or towns that are affected, but it's a national treasure. So yeah, that's my yeah. And, this one. and so the longer term kind of ecological mm -hmm. restoration issues are just that they're longer term. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, for the federal and state agencies, there is woefully insufficient money to actually deal with long term ecological restoration. Um, so it is sort of heartbreaking that nature has to take her own pace to do these things. And, and that pace, uh, you know, it can be a very slow process, like hundreds or thousands of years to well, get back to a ecosystem that we would recognize. Uh, it well, is heartbreaking. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, somebody did ask about the site for fires. It's INCI web, I N C I W E B. Um, okay, and, I'm, I'm going to take Chris. Are you going to put that in in the chat? Yeah, I believe. Um, oh, the INCI web as well. I can. I know. Yeah. INCI web. Dot. It's an ORG, isn't it? Um, is INCI web dot org or dot gov? That's a good question. Yeah, let me sit down <laughs> here. I was like, <laughs> somewhere I have it open if I can find the right one. Um, okay, it's in INCIW. Oh, here, let me do this. And this is actually the Telegraph Fires NC web. So it, it, it is, it's a .gov. Thank you. Ju <laughs> Judith is on top of this stuff for us. Judith, okay. <laughs> Judith has gotten in the web and the AZ fire info. So look in the chat box for that information. We got it. And I'm going to go ahead and close this down right now. I think we've got another question that we can, we'll answer off afterwards, but okay. I'll try to keep this at the hour. And so let me get my last slide up. Thank you very much, Carol. You I've learned a lot. Welcome. I appreciate everybody who's been with us here today. I know that this is going to get followed up with uh, with many views. So here's Carol again of coalitions and collaboratives. We just had our Q&A. And next week, we will have Dr. Matt Pace with us, a meteorologist for the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. He's going to be talking about forecasting wildfire smoke and smoke management in Arizona. So happens at all levels. We're just trying to understand everything that's going on here. So we'll please come back, learn more about the smoke. And so I'm looking forward to that presentation. And Thanks, with, everybody. Just want to say have a good day and see you all next week.